John 15, beginning in verse one, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that was spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, hear the warning. He is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, now mind you, this is not a prosperity preacher saying this. These are the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. I wish I had more time to explain this, but if I'm abiding in him and he's abiding in me, then what I wish is what he wishes. And if I am wishing what he wishes for me, then he is obligated to give it to me because I'm wishing what he wishes that I already wish. By this, verse eight, my father is glorified that you bear not just fruit, but you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. His name is Matt Emmons. You may have heard of him. He is an Olympian marksman. Several Olympic cycles ago, uh, Matt Emmons was doing so well that going into the final round of competition in the 50 meter rifle competition, he was told that all he had to do in this final round was hit the target, anywhere on the target, and he would win gold. So here is Matt, it's the final round. He sets his sights on the target, he calms himself, he pulls the trigger, and when it's all said and done, true story, Matt does not win gold. He doesn't even win silver or bronze. Matt, what in the world happened? Let's let Matt tell us. Will you look at it with me? Matt says, I didn't look at the number above the target before the last shot, said Emmons. I usually always look through the scope at the number first and then drop down to the target. I was just working on calming myself down and getting a good shot off. I should have looked. Matt's problem is not that he failed to hit the target. Matt's problem is that he failed to hit the right target. My concern for us today is that so many well-meaning, well-intentioned Christians are hitting targets just the wrong target. John 15 verses one through eight is the target. It is the epicenter of the Christian life. If you are new to the kingdom of God or if you wouldn't even call yourself a follower of Jesus, I would say to you, if, if the Bible could be whittled down to eight verses, John 15, one through eight are those eight verses. Miss this target and you miss the Christian life. John 15, one through eight is the target. What Disney World is to Orlando. 
what the Hollywood sign is to Southern California, what Wall Street in Times Square is to New York, John 15 verses one through eight is to the follower of Jesus Christ. It is our target. But again, so many Christians have made secondary targets primary targets. I grew up in a Christian home. I'm so grateful for my mom and dad. They just celebrated 53 years of marriage. I didn't have to look outside my home for heroes. I'm, I'm blessed. They, they, they trained me up in the fear and the admonition of God. And yet I feel like the Christian subculture outside of that home I was brought up in totally missed the target. I grew up in an era, in a culture of, of what I would call purity culture. Well, I remember going to youth groups and it seems as if every single message I heard from my youth pastor was don't have sex outside of marriage, don't have sex outside of marriage, don't have sex outside of marriage. And hear me, that is really important. The Bible says strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. But I want you to understand my morality is secondary to an intimate relationship with Christ. Or to say it another way, hell will be filled with many virgins. Heaven will be filled with many former prostitutes. I am not saved based on what I do or don't do on Saturday night. My moral try harder attempts does not get me into the kingdom. If it did, I wouldn't need a savior and I wouldn't need a cross. I am saved by Christ alone. So many other Christians, their target is quiet times. Read your Bible, pray, read your Bible, pray, read your Bible, pray. And I want you to understand me. Yes, the Bible is, is so important and praying is so important. In fact, the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, is all about the Word of God. But I want you to understand, if, if quiet times were the primary target, then the Pharisees get into the kingdom. These were people who read the Bible, who memorized the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. That's, they memorized Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus. They memorized Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They prayed the Shema 18 times a day. They had quiet times with metronome consistency, and yet, what does Jesus refer to these quiet time keeping people as whitewashed graveyards full of dead men's bones? And, and I fear in the buckle of the Bible belt, that is some of you. You know your Bible backwards and forwards. You memorize a scripture a day to keep the devil away, but you are as legalistic and self-righteous and cold-hearted as they come. There is no deep love for God. There is no deep intimacy for Christ. You know the Bible, you have quiet times, but your own kids want nothing to do with you. Quiet times, hear me, are a pathway to intimacy. They are not the destination. Quiet times are sort of like date nights. My wife and I this past Wednesday just celebrated 25 years of marriage. 25 years. I didn't plan it out right because um, she turned 50 three weeks before. You know, me just trying to be a good fiscal steward of the Lord's blessings. I was looking for a two for one deal, Priscilla. I was trying to, you know, I'm trying to steward the Lord's money. Brothers, any brothers in the house feel me on this? I'm just trying to put it together. She goes, oh, no, 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 no. no. Those are two very separate things. We're going to keep them separate. Y'all don't care about the Lord's money. So. In those early days of marriage, man, we, we, we did date nights. And it's interesting 
What we would do, the kids were young, and you know, it's, it's, it's hard to really connect in that phase of life, and so when we'd get on each other's nerves, we would just store that away for date night. And we'd keep a running list. And here we are eating a good steak dinner on a date night that's supposed to be about connecting, and we're taking shots at one another. And what I learned is you can't manufacture intimacy. You can only make room for it. It is possible to get up early in the morning to read your Bible and pray and miss Jesus. John 15, one through eight is the destination. It's an intimate abiding relationship with Christ. Jesus begins by saying, hear it now, I am. The Gospel of John is one of four sanctioned biographies on the life of Christ. Each biography, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, looks at Jesus from a different angle. John's angle has to do with the deity, the godness of Jesus. If you're a new believer, I would highly recommend that you start in the Gospel of John. If you don't know Christ, I want to encourage you, start in the Gospel of John. John is underscoring the deity, the godness of Christ. And right up the gates, we see the deity in our text. Jesus refers to himself as I am. You may not know this, but I am is the loftiest name of God in the Bible. He hearkens us back to Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter three, here is Moses. He's an 80 year old man who is tending sheep on the backside of Midian. He sees a peculiar sight one day. He sees a bush that is burning, but is not being burnt up. Out of that, he hears a voice. Moses, take off your shoes. The ground upon which you are standing is holy ground. They have a conversation. God says, Moses, go down. Moses, way down to Egypt land. Tell O Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses hits God with a litany of excuses. They go back and forth and back and forth. Finally, Moses wisely acquiesces. He says to God, who shall I say sent me? God says, tell Pharaoh, I am. Not I was. Not I will be, but I am. It is a statement of the sufficiency of God. He is sufficient to meet yesterday's needs, tomorrow's needs, and today's needs all at the same time. I am sent you. Jesus then now co-ops this language in the Gospel of John. He, he says such things as, I am the bread of life, I am the door, I am the shepherd, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In our text, he says, I am the true vine. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. The religious leaders get ticked off because they understand correctly that when Jesus is using that language, he is not saying, I'm just a good person. He is not saying, I'm just a good teacher. He is not saying, I'm your average, ordinary, run-of-the-mill rabbi. He is saying, I am God, which is why they tried to kill him. So what I want you to understand, again, if you're here and you don't know Christ, this drives me nuts in the world. You have so many people in our world, when it comes to Jesus, they take a middle of the road response. Oh, he's a nice guy. I, I, I don't think he's for me, but he's, no, 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 no. Anybody who says they're God, they're either exactly who they say they are, or they are a lunatic. There's no middle ground. On the way to church today, I saw signs for, for Waco. And of course, I thought of David Koresh and other cult leaders like Jim Jones. These people got up and said they were God while wearing glasses. I'm sorry, you can't be my God and go to lens crafters. I need you to have 2020 vision. You know what I'm saying? So I just want to help you out. I just want... If you start deconstructing and leaving the faith and you follow someone who says they're God, but they got on a set of these, use discernment. Are you with me on that? In our text, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Jesus is talking to people in a region called Palestine and 
And Palestine was known as the land of the vineyards. In fact, some 200 times in in the Bible, this imagery of vines and vineyards is used. Noah, one of the first things he does when he gets off the ark is he constructs and cultivates a vineyard. Israel is called numerous times the vineyard of the Lord. Hosea says Israel is a luxuriant vine. In the intertestamental period, the period between Malachi and Matthew, the Jews had a coin and inscribed on the coin was a vine. If you went to the temple there at the doors of the holy place was a gold golden vine. So to use this imagery of the vine over and over again would have resonated with these people. The question is why? Why Jesus, of all the images you could have used, why do you use the imagery of you being the vine? Because the purpose of every vine, the purpose of every vineyard is fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, he would say later on, and I in him, he it is who will bear much fruit. The point of your life is not church attendance. The point of your life is that you would bear fruit. Now what then is fruit? Look at this definition with me, will you? On the screen, fruit, here it is, is the visible display of the character of Christ through an abiding relationship with him for the benefit of others and the glory of God. Fruit is the visible display of the character of Christ through an abiding relationship with him for the benefit of others and the glory of God. Here's what happened to you when you got saved. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit moved inside of you. Paul would tell the Corinthians, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? When the Holy Spirit moved inside of you, two primary things happened. One is he gave you gifts. These gifts, Paul would say, are to be used for the edification, that is, the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, if you are a member of a local church and you are not using the gifts that God has given you, you are literally putting the Holy Spirit on the bench. God has called you to be a contributor and not a consumer. So many so-called Christians, when it comes to church, they have a cruise ship mentality when God is calling us to have a battleship mentality. You know, on a cruise ship, it's all about you. On a cruise ship, you can complain about the food. On a cruise ship, you can complain about the bedding. On a cruise ship, you can complain about the events because it's all about you. On a battleship, no one complains about the sleeping arrangements. No one complains about the food because on a battleship, it ain't about you. It's about the mission. God has given you gifts and has situated you within the context of a local church so that you would use your gifts for the building up and the edification of the body. But gifts are not enough. Jesus actually tells us that hell will be filled with gifted people. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, Jesus says, many will come to me saying, here are the gifts. Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? And Jesus says, thank you, but depart from me. I never knew you. Hell will have many gifted Bible teachers. Hell will have many gifted singers who are on the praise team. Because what what authenticates my faith ain't my gifts, it's fruit. Jesus says in Matthew chapter seven, verse 22, you shall recognize them by their fruit. What is fruit? It is a changed and changing lifestyle that cannot be blamed on the normal maturation process of adulthood, but can only be blamed on the surrendered, submitted life to the indwelling power of the Spirit of God pulsating through my life. In other words, every true blue follower of Jesus Christ should be able to look through the mirror of their journey with Jesus and conclude two things. One, I have not arrived. I'm not perfect and I won't be on this side of heaven. 
We sing a song by James Cleveland in my little church growing up, a little song in which James Cleveland says, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. I, 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 I gotta tell you, that while I look, should be able to look through the rearview mirror of my journey with Jesus and conclude I haven't arrived, I should also be able to look back and say, while I haven't arrived, I am not where I once was. He is changing me. My pastor, Bishop Ulmer, says it this way. He said it in front of 13,000 people, so I don't mind saying it to you. He says, you know what? When I first got saved, I used to cuss at the drop of a hat. He says, now since following Jesus, I don't cuss that fast anymore. I am not condoning cursing. But do you see the change? See, this is a word for my charismatic siblings. And I'm charismatic with a seatbelt. I'm very much charismatic. One of the problems with our charismatic siblings is they can sometimes emphasize gifts and diminish fruit. I have some charismatic friends who can talk in tongues with the best of them and then cuss you out on the parking lot. It ain't how high you jump, but it's how straight you walk once you come down. It is, it is fruit. It is fruit. And the purpose of fruit is not for you. An apple tree does not exist for itself. An orange tree does not exist for us. In fact, you know, you know what we call fruit that eats itself? Rotten. You were created to better people around you. Now, how does God get fruit through our lives? Let's go home on this one. Three things the text says. He says, you were created to bear much fruit. How does that happen? If John 15, one through eight is the epicenter of the Christian life, John 15, verse four is the heartbeat of the epicenter. Verse four, look at it with me. Jesus says, key word, abide. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Uh, here's John, he's uh, writing in a language called Greek. The, the Greek word for abide, watch it now, it, it means to stay, it means to linger, it means to hang out. I love drinking tea. And over the years I've learned that there are two grand philosophical approaches to tea. One is a very incorrect approach. It's called dippers. They take the tea bag up and down, in and out, in and out, in and out. I'm like, you are frustrating me. <laughs> and that's how so many Christians approach their relationship with Christ, up and down, in and out, in and out. But then there's another approach to drinking tea, a much more godly yeah. <laughs> approach. It ain't dipping, it's abiding. They take the bag and they drop it in the water and they leave it. Yeah. You know what's interesting over time, what happens to that water? It totally transforms and it takes on the color, the character, and the content of the bag. And, and the water isn't even trying. All the water is doing is lingering, it's abiding, it's staying. And a part of its commitment to linger and abide and stay, the natural result of that is transformation. Jesus says this, if you abide in me and I abide in you, transformation won't happen tomorrow, it's not gonna happen next week, it won't happen next month, but you keep staying, you keep lingering, you keep abiding in my presence and you're gonna take on the character and the color and the flavor of who I am. You abide. You abide in me. But there's something else that we learned that produces fruitfulness. 
it's not just this idea of abiding, but it's this idea of, and I hate to say this, waiting. Notice in our text who's doing all the work. Jesus and God. Jesus says, I am the true vine, which means Jesus is saying, I am the one who is pumping in my character into you. God is the vine dresser. He, he is the one who is pruning you. M my job, it's not about my striving. It's about my surrendering. It's, it's about my abiding. It, it is Jesus and, and God who are doing the bulk of the work of transformation in my life. I, I want to stop right here, though, and I want to temper that because it's not like we don't have a part to play. We do. In fact, I'm thinking of, of Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. He says, work out, work out, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But he's not done, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So hear me, I do bring some things to the table but I am not ultimately transformed by my own efforts it is I bring these things to the table and I lean into God and over a process it is God who is doing the work in my life now I want you to imagine I want you to imagine that you have just bought some land in Napa wine country it's about $80,000 an acre. God has blessed you. You've bought this land and, and you want to cultivate a vineyard. Here's my question. How long does it take before you get fruit? There's a master vine dresser. His name is Christoph. Christoph is a master vine dresser in Napa. Look, listen to what Christoph says. Look at with me on the screen. He says, this is a long-term investment. The third year we get some fruit but we let it drop to the ground. Did you get that? First two years, no fruit. Third year, we get some, but we let it drop. The fourth year, we'll get a small first harvest, which is fermented and aged in a barrel for two years before being bottled. Between the first planting and the first bottle is about eight years. That's something people new in the valley really fail to appreciate. In this industry, you're not making your first dollar until year eight, and you're probably not making a profit until year 15. Quality takes time. There's waiting. And I know we don't like waiting, but, but hear me. Sort of like, I, 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 listen, uh, Gen Z alert, you're not going to get this analogy, but there's something your grandmama had. It wasn't called an air fryer. We, we call it a crock pot. I know I just lost Gen Z. I know I just lost some of you young millennials. Every time you turn that air fryer on, I promise you, big mama is turning over in her grave. You put something in a crock pot. You slow cook it. Put the lid on top of it, and you just wait. You just, you just wait. I want you to understand, if you could take a tour of God's kitchen, there are no microwaves. There are no air fryers. There's only crock pots. God is saying, listen, I know you want to get to where you're going quick, fast, and in a hurry. But the cruelest thing God is saying I could ever do to you is to give you a blessing that you do not have the character infrastructure to support. And the only thing worse than waiting on God is wishing that you had. So I gotta put you in my divine crock pot. I gotta put a lid on top of you. I gotta put you in situations and circumstances that are gonna drive you nuts. But there's a cloud of biblical witnesses out there that could tell you on the other side of the crock pot is fall off the bone succulent faith. There's a richness that comes by just marinating in the vine. God is saying, will you trust me enough that I know what I'm doing to wait on me 
And you're gonna be in situations where you're gonna go crazy, but I want you to think of people, when you think of people like Moses, 80 years in the crock pot till God shows up one day and takes the lid off and says, now you're ready. I, I want you to think of people like Joseph, 13 years in the crock pot. When we meet him, he's a 17-year-old punk kid who's bragging on his dreams to his brothers, but 13 years in the crock pot, now he's ready to be second in command. David was in the crock pot. He was anointed in 1 Kings 16, but 15 years in the crock pot before he could ascend to the throne. Jesus, Jesus spent 30 years in the crock pot. Paul, 14 years, he said, I spent in the desert. And you're impatient because it's been six months. We need seasoned Christians who are going to stay connected to the vine because I'm not in this for the benefits package. I'm ride or die. And God, whatever you want to do, I'm going to wait. I'm going to look to the hills from where does my help come from. My help comes from the Lord. God, when you're ready to come get me, I'm here. Oh, Cliff, this is a word for this church, isn't it? Yeah. We've been praying and we're going to pray. But I'm excited when God takes the lid off this bad boy, the flavor that's going to come out of this congregation and this community, because you've been waiting and God's going to say, now you're ready. Oh, we're going to rejoice on that day, friends. How does God get fruit from my life? Abiding and waiting, finally. Suffering. I didn't think you'd shout on that. <laughs> UC Davis just released a study. They did a 60-year study on wine country. Here's what they said. In the last 60 years, they said, we've noticed two phenomenon in wine country that's happened on parallel tracks. There's been a rise in heat and a rise in quality. Their conclusion, the hotter the temperature, the better the wine. Paul would say it this way to the Romans, will you look at it with me? Paul would say, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Paul, are you kidding me? How in the world are you rejoicing not after your sufferings, not before your sufferings? How are you able to rejoice in your sufferings? Hear it, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Paul is saying I am able to, to rejoice in my sufferings because I see what's on the other side of the suffering. I'm sorry, you can't pastor me if you ain't been through nothing. I'm sorry, I need more than a PhD. I need somebody who's been through some things. And he says we get fruit through a peculiar kind of suffering. It's called pruning. Last thing, I'm done. Christoph, the master vintner, here's what he says about pruning. Look at it with me. It's the little cuts that are the most important. You can't come in with a pair of shears and clip like crazy. You don't just look at what appears to be a dead branch and cut it off and then look at a branch full of fruit and think it's fine. Over the course of pruning, you make a series of very precise strategic cuts that will produce the healthiest, most robust vines. God is saying, hey, Brian, 
I have an agenda for your life. Much fruit. So Brian, what that means is I'm going to have to cut this friendship off. I know you enjoy that person, but where I'm taking you, they're getting in the way of that much fruit. They were good for this season, Brian. But Brian, while I'm at it, I'm going to have to cut that job. Because I think that job, Brian, was becoming an idol. It was becoming a status symbol. So I, I need to, I need, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. Remember, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. But I'm going to have to prune that job. Brian, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to prune some of your health. Because, Brian, it's real easy to forget about me in seasons of prosperity. Brian, I've just kind of learned that I, I get better prayer from you when you don't know how the test results are going to show. So, so let me just prune a little. I ain't heard from you in a minute, Brian. So let me just, let me just prune that. Now, here's what the devil does. You ready for this? When we're getting pruned, the devil says, where is your God? But any master vine dresser will tell you, the closest the vine dresser ever is to the vine is when it's pruning. The vine dresser isn't far away. It's as close as it ever is. And so where is God when I'm being pruned? He's right here, closer than when he's ever been to your life, carefully inspecting that he might bring much fruit. I got to end with some really bad news. My commitment is not to tell you what you want to hear. It's to tell you what the word says. You know what Jesus says? Jesus gives a warning in our text. Jesus says, if anyone, verse 6, does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, you can play textual gymnastics with this, if you will. That is a metaphor for hell. They didn't lose their salvation. How can you lose something you never earned? They never had it. John says in 1 John chapter 2, they went out from us, but they were never really...